Well, thank you, Paige, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. In preparing reserve studies, we often come across managers and boards looking for a little assistance in the larger subject of financial accountability as they try to do the right thing. So we're fortunate to have with us today guest expert Russell Munns to fill this gap and help you lead a fiscally responsible association. This is the outline for today's program, taking you through a few subject areas as we help prepare you to lead a fiscally responsible association. There are many financial challenges you'll face handling the finances of an association. One common concern is just managing the cash flow. And that means setting up systems where all owners and members are providing the scheduled income to the association and managing any delinquencies. And of course, you know, any growing delinquencies will cause problems paying your bills. And as a nonprofit, you sustain the association by having a budget where your income balances your expenses or bills. Then, of course, you need to have systems in place to prevent embezzlement because you don't have enough margin for losing money. In addition, there's the challenges of managing management costs or payroll and making wise reserve funding decisions. But you probably all know these challenges better than I do because you're the ones actually running the association. So thank you for joining us today. We plan to give you some tools to make sure you have some good systems in place to ensure you have a watertight, fiscally responsible association. We're here today because we believe, like famous investor Warren Buffett has said, that while we learn from the mistakes we make, it's better to learn from the mistakes of others. And in addition to learning from the mistakes of others, let's be smart about what changes to make to our standards and protocols. We don't wanna make things worse by just changing things around us for the sake of change. So let's follow the advice from Gene Kranz, Apollo 13's flight director, when he was faced with trying to get some astronauts home safely from a crippled spacecraft. He said, let's work the problem and not make things worse by guessing. As we go through today's webinar, because everyone's been muted to keep background noise to a minimum, if Russell or I ever need your feedback, we'll ask for hands raised. And you do that by clicking the hands raised icon in your control panel. It looks like the one I'm showing on screen. So let's give that a go. Grab your mouse and click the hands raised icon in your control panel if you're ready for us to get started on today's presentation. Looking up and down the list, Paige and Russell, we have a sharp group with us today. Okay, thank you very much. Keep that in mind. We will be doing this again. I'm going to click hands down. We're fortunate to have Russell Munns with us today as a former manager who now focuses on providing financial services to associations. Russell has just the right background to share how best practices, standard procedures, and regular reports can help you manage your cash flow and avoid detours and dead ends so you can lead your association towards a peaceful and fiscally responsible future. So Russell, please share with our audience some best practices. Well, thanks, Robert, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today to learn more about how to keep your uh, associations more fiscally responsible. And uh, one of the most important things you can do is to prevent harm to your association, and that's due to the loss of money, which can happen two ways. One, you can uh, collect the money, or two, you can uh, have an embezzlement happen at your community. If you don't watch out, it can happen, it's especially true during unsettled times when you might be trying to make uh, mid-year changes and your financial situation is not as stable as usual. Uh, and crime reports all across the country prove that point. So uh, fraud can happen. Yeah, hopefully it doesn't happen at your association, but I'm going to uh, relay some information today which comes from the, uh, I say the best practices come from the worst practices. And I've studied over 20 uh, case studies of fraud and embezzlement by board members, 
community managers that were either on site or on site staff, as well as portfolio management companies. So we'll get right into it. Next slide. Will, so you want to have checks and balances, whether that is uh, two board members uh, having checks and balances or segregation of duties in the management office or in the, in the uh, on-site office. Uh, and then also the board needs to review the monthly financial reports and you need to get those reports on a timely basis. Too often I see communities where they don't get financial reports on a monthly basis and uh, that's when you lose track of what's happening at your community and you need to take a look at uh, you know, bank statements and bank reconciliations and those financial reports that we'll go over later so you can course correct in time and, and pick up some red flags. So there, you know, I, I often get this question about how do we pay for minor expenses? So the, the best answer is if you have infrequent expenses at a community that just a board member comes out of pocket and then submits a reimbursement and is repaid before the credit, their credit card statement is due. Um, if you do need to go the route of debit and credit card, which you know you need to track those when there's turnover in personnel or board members, uh, but you need to, uh, the best practice is to put a separate bank checking account associated with a debit card and limit the amount of funds in that bank account to say $1,000. Uh, some of the, um, you know, one of the uh, embezzlement case studies had a, a manager who had uh, daily went to the bank and withdrew the limit for the debit card and did that you know over a course of several days and obviously you could keep doing that and until you drain the bank account so you want that's why we have a sep we, we suggest a separate bank account credit cards have a limit but um, you know it's also um, so that's could be handy petty cash is you know we highly recommend against accepting cash and ex against keeping a petty cash account it's just it it seems to be very problematic in accounting for it so um, you know again the best is to you know use the local supply houses that'll invoice you and then pay those invoices on a monthly basis or have a reimbursement of a board member next is we're going to like I said, one, uh, eliminate single person control. Um, you know, I've seen where there's uh, one person, one board member who's in charge of all the financials and the checkbook, and that has led in the case studies to, you know, fraud. Um, uh, there was uh, one case study, there was a, a lady in Florida, she had health issues and her store was having business troubles. She's on the board for a long time. Uh, she wrote out checks to pay for things to uh, for personal expenses and until she had a health issue which which made her leave the board temporarily that's when other board members found out what was happening um, also make sure if you know from a management company point of view you don't want to have you know two p you know you don't want to have just one person approving bills and cutting the checks uh, and another red flag is make sure that the you know, if you're running, if you're in a management company, that the accounting staff takes vacations because uh, that's also a red flag of th that there could be something happening if people don't take vacations. All right, next up is accounts payable. So two people are required to, you know, should be required to approve uh, bills. So similar to, you know, this is taking what most states have for reserve accounts, where it requires uh, authorization by you know two two or two people on the board. Uh, same thing with regular uh, transactions. We try and, and see that either if there's a property manager uh, has to approve something and then it goes to a board member, typically the treasurer, or if it's uh, if if the association self-managed, uh, they have two board members approved before payment. Typically, it's the treasurer and then the president. And then uh, you know sometimes we get asked, does it have to be every invoice? And so sometimes we have the two-step approval process where the second person is just approving things over $500 or $1,000. Um, you wanna make sure that you're accurately 
coding your invoices because that'll help when we get to the financial reports to see any variances between what's budgeted for and what the actual expenses are. Uh, if you have a checkbook or and a management company, they have check stock, which is paper that goes into a check printer. Make sure that those are locked up and also accounted for, so you don't have somebody uh, with an old, you know, that has a, an old checkbook that is able to write from there. Um, and then you also want to note duplicate payments. I've seen uh, communities where they've had over fifty thousand dollars of duplicate payments made to a vendor because the vendor had submitted multiple invoices for the same item or they submitted an invoice and then they followed up with a statement that had the prior balance and then the new balance and then things got confused and the you know too many bills were paid. Uh, and hopefully your vendors are uh, scrupulous and, and uh, give you the money back. Um, and then, so we wanna compare this to budget and we'll take a look at that in the next, uh, in the financial reports. Up next is payroll. And so one, one of the uh, case studies had an on-site manager where they used Quicken, uh, which are, you know the software is cheap, so maybe they, the, the community was going for cheap software and we're already paying for on-site staff, so might as well have them do the payroll. Well, they ended up paying themselves extra payroll checks and bonuses, and so it's always better to have somebody else doing it and have it separated. So I recommend using an outside service. Um, the withholding amounts change, uh, you know, periodically, and you know, I know management companies where they have uh, not kept up with the file. You know, the withholding changes. Then there's penalties, uh, and there's and the withholding is due, and you know, the clients aren't happy, and the management company has to pay pay the fine. So it's you know, I would just recommend having a specialist deal with the payroll. Next, for delinquencies, so. Again, like I said, collecting money and keeping your delinquencies to a minimum is part of that uh, protecting your assets and making sure that you're collecting as much of the revenue as you can. So you wanna communicate regularly with owners, whether that's mailed or emailed billing statements and coupons. Uh, there's a reason why utility companies uh, use Month, you know, send out monthly statements with return envelopes because it's more effective at keeping delinquencies down. So that's a, one of the a better practice in, in our industry also. Provide multiple payment methods, give people as many ways to pay to make it easy for them to pay. So you've got some owners who have multiple homes live in out of state. You've got some that are, um, might have this uh, their home as a second home. They might have you know, travel for work, they might be in the military and traveling abroad. So make it easy. Uh, I'm still surprised how many communities don't accept online payments. And so provide online payments if you can. Some people want, uh, a lot of people still want to pay by check. So give that, you know, uh, allow for that. Um, and obviously bill pay from the owner's bank. That's really just the bank's you know, the owner's bank, uh, the homeowner's bank is is printing and mailing a check. So that's the same as a check. And then credit cards uh, to keep out of your collection, your delinquency process. It's great if you can offer homeowners the ability to pay by a credit card so that they can uh, make a payment that way um, as well. And that credit card charge is typically uh, added to the owner, owner's fee when they check out. All right. Next for delinquency best practices is to have a clear uh, collection policy. And so, you know, you this collection policy, if you haven't heard of that before, it is a document that's going to outline specifically what actions are gonna happen and the time sequence. So at 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, 90 days, these are things that are gonna happen. Here, these are the fees that we charge some of it's driven off of your bylaws, but it's also driven off of best practices. Um, and so we have a sample, uh, you know, uh, collection policy on the resources page of our website. If you want to take a look at that later and then adjust it for your community, I tell you that some of the things also that uh, are are you know I find uh, are ineffective are the late fees from like a 1980s bylaws that. Uh, that are $10 or $5. And so that's not much of a deterrent. So make sure that your late fees are an actual deterrent. Uh, and then 
you know, the uh, other thing is make sure you have a process. So you'll need to make sure that you add late fees on a regular basis and they're posted, uh, that you have a system of being able to send out late letters if that's in your collection policy, and then have a um, HOA specific uh, collections attorney or collection agency that you work with to help you collect the monies. Um, you know, you, uh, if you're a self-managed board, you, you know, you're not, you're not a licensed uh, collection agency. Many states have laws around that and you, you don't really want to get involved in, in pestering your neighbors about monies. So make sure you, you know, hire an expert to help you with that. Also best practice is reporting late payments to the credit agency. Guess what? If, if you're, if the car and the credit card and the mortgage all report to the credit agency, it's a best practice for them. It should be a best practice for HOAs and HOAs and condos don't do it. And guess who gets paid last? The HOA and the condo community because uh, there's consequences for the other bills. Um, so it works. Up, uh, Okay. Next is to continue to manage your income coming in. So uh, make sure that when you're depositing the funds, you're working, you know, either your community, you know, if you're working with a manager make, or an accounting company, make sure that they have separate bank accounts for your community versus other clients they have. So no co-mingling. It's shocking to me that this still happens. We had, we transitioned the client uh, last year and they were, you know, the, the, provider was commingling funds with other communities. Um, but th and that's a big no-no. The next thing is we wanna separate accounts for reserves funds, not just for the interest that they uh, provide, but also to segregate uh, so that your saving uh, isn't touched from your operating expenses. Um, a best practice is to put have money go directly to the bank. So that would be a bank lockbox where the bank has a secure PO box for payments to be mailed to, and then they transfer those that mail to a scanning facility to process and, and deposit those funds on a nightly basis. And so that's, you know, having money go directly to the bank is better it's to bypass the management you know, company or the office, the on-site office. If you have an on-site office or a management company, one of the, set, the items that people could use is a check scanner rather than having to send somebody to the bank and make physical deposits and um, it's it saves time however it is less uh, you know it, there's less of a benefit than just putting the checks to the lockbox because the 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 accounting staff has to do data entry and if you do use a check scanner make sure to destroy the checks out and a good rule of thumb is to destroy those checks after 45 days because they do have routing numbers and uh, account numbers on them. So we want to get rid of those. Uh, a great way, you know, I'm surprised still how many, probably about half of the boards that I've talked to don't have uh, access to view the bank accounts online. So I think being able to see their money coming in is a, is a you know, uh, something that boards should have access to. And then close unused accounts. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. So if you're not keeping an eye on it, it can open a door for fraud. If somebody had one of those old checkbooks lying around, it also reduces the time to review your financial reports because it's one less thing to look at and less also re reduces the amount of time to reconcile those accounts. But, you know, and a big consideration is also, I had a client that the a board, one of the board members passed away. Another board member uh, had moved away and they didn't have, additional information on how to contact them. And it took over a year for the for a new board to get access to over $100,000 of their money. And that's just, you know, it, it, it took, it's just a long time and it's tedious. So I'd say, you know, and it's another reason to close accounts that are not being used because the signature cards typically aren't updated. So that is the last of the best practices and before we get into the four reports to pay attention to. Russell, that's fantastic. That's a great foundation on best practices. I'm sure we could have spent uh, an entire webinar going into those points in more detail, allowing you to elaborate and tell some stories to illustrate the reasons why. Can I get a uh, hands raised from our audience if you're following along and ready for Russell to dive into the next section of our program? Very nice. 
Okay, Russell, you're doing a great job of keeping everyone with us. Okay, I'm gonna click hands down. So Russell, how does someone get a good grip on the pulse of the association, learning where the money is coming from and where it's going? Looking, taking timely measurements of that pulse, which is the financial reports, and that provides the financial health of your community. And, you know, I, I laugh at um, when I've seen some management reports that go to boards and they're like probably a, an inch thick of financial reports on a monthly basis. And I know that the, the board volunteers basically didn't look at them. So the volunteers are busy and uh, with a, you know, I think that the stack of reports, which is designed to impress is not impressive. And in fact, it just adds to confusion. And I think it's better to keep it simple. And so these are my top or my favorite four reports to help see where the association is and operate the association. And if you have limited time, where, what do you look at? So uh, you can also look at these to plug holes in spending if you've spent more than anticipated. And that's where we're going to jump right in with this uh, income and expense report. So this isn't some software packages don't have this comparative income and expense report that can, that has the budget uh, in in there. So you can take a look at your monthly cost, your monthly income and expense versus what was budgeted and any variance. And then you've got your year to date actual costs and your year to date uh, budget and any variance. And what you want to do, this is my favorite report to operate a community, is to look for the variances and then ask questions. So, for example, you might have a water bill that's gone up by three times uh, and your variance. So you, you take a look at your variance and it could have been that there's a you've got a leak underground that you need to research from a route that you know broke into a pipe or a truck came to cut down a tree and they rolled over a pipe of the, the water main the water pipe and that's leaking underground but nobody can see it and that's where you're going to see it on the financial report and there might be some ways to explain the variances like an insurance payment was made you know for your annual premium instead of accruing it over several months but at least you'll ask the questions and be able to flag things that uh, the look look weird like uh, in that instance where the property manager was writing themselves a lot of uh, payroll checks and bonus checks that you would see that your hopefully you would see that your uh, your your salaried expenses from for uh, staff was a higher um, <laughs> yeah so i thought i thought we only paid her this much how come it's double exactly all right. So, and next the uh, is the balance sheet. So it's a snapshot at a point in time where you see how much money you have or where your liabilities are. So um, you'll see your operating account. You'll see your reserve accounts, and the reserve accounts can be broken out. I've seen this for reserves where they break out the you know for a particular capital project. So the roof account. You know, there's this much money for the roof. There's this much money for the roads. The, whatever the project is, and it's further broken out. You'll also be able to see your delinquencies, any bills that have gone unpaid, and so you'll be able to uh, have a good understanding of, of your finances from the balance sheet. One thing that you want to also note here is, uh, has anything significantly changed uh, over the last month? How come we're down $20,000 in our operating account, uh, you know, for example? Um, and it's, again, something to investigate. Next up, and this is a report that it doesn't get uh, added to many financial, you know, to any to many monthly financial packages. Uh, it's the bank reconciliation uh, report. In this report, its job is to confirm that what's in the bank is what's shown on the financial reports. So uh, make sure you're getting this. It's a place where fraud can happen if you don't get it. Uh, one example is I uh, had a a management company uh, in Connecticut where they stole over two million dollars. The controller stole over two million dollars. The way they did it was they didn't have they didn't use the bank reconciliation report. There were no bank statements on the financials, and the controller had doctored the financial reports. So that's why this is one of my favorite four. Uh, and then lastly is the age delinquencies. So this is going to drive your 
collection process. So you're going to use your collection policy, and then you're going to look at who's at the 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, and make sure that they're following along in the collection policy that you have for your association. And that rounds out the top four, but you can add a couple other supporting reports, which are the bank statements, which could be added to the back of your financial report package. Um, but even better is to have online access to the bank account. And this day and age, uh, boards should have that, in my opinion. Uh, also, the reserve study, so you know where you are with your uh, savings and if you're on track, and Robert will talk about that some more in detail. And then to review, your, you want to make sure that you kind of have a understanding about your uh, what your line item costs should be, and make sure you've got them shown on your on a on, you know your budget versus what your actuals are, and know see what you know take a, a deeper look into those variances if you have them. Uh, if you are having problems collecting funds uh, because of a recession or a pandemic or what it might be. Take a look at mid-year. Maybe you want to push off some projects if you're having a budget shortfall. So if you had painting, you know, a painting project scheduled or you, you know, and you're paying these out of your operating expenses, you may want to postpone that for a year and change your budget. Um, so uh, typical delinquencies I would say are, are basically two to two two to 10% of the owners are delinquent at any time, uh, but this depends on the community and also the economic environment and that can spike and just make sure that you've got a plan of how to, how to deal with it. Um, all right, so in summary, you know, the, when you, I, I always liken this to the price is right. Everybody kind of has a sense of what things cost for like a, a carton of eggs or a gallon of milk, but when it comes to larger items, they're they're usually way off. So that you're dealing with much bigger numbers, and you've got a fiduciary responsibility. So make sure you're, you know, you enlist enlist support. Uh, so if you need, I would say you need more than one board member working on this, and so ask somebody to help. If you're a larger community and it's more complicated. I've seen you know communities with finance committees that help with overseeing the financials. Um, sometimes managers are great with people and the building stuff, but are weak in accounting. And so just know what your strengths and weaknesses are and reach out for support. Um, you know, there's support out there. You can get it from your CPA, make sure they're HOA, you know, or, you know, homeowner community association specific CPA collection professionals, uh, webinars like this are a good place for education and also companies like us can help with this function as well. Thanks, Russell. And uh, now to our audience, Russell and I had some fun preparing for this webinar, talking about how can we best communicate this information to the, uh, the people who are attending. And we thought about driving a car. Um, there's a real relationship between the two. There's some normal things that you do, some best practices, that help you get safely from one place to another. And many of these are habits that you're doing even without thinking. But let's take a couple of moments to examine them and kind of reveal some of the things that you're doing that are best practices in the simple task of driving a car. First is clearly keeping your eyes on the road, looking at what is ahead. Second is checking your speedometer to see how fast you're traveling. Third is being aware of the indicators on your dashboard that tell you if everything's fine with the car or how the car is doing. And then finally, having your eyes always moving around, checking your mirrors and being aware of what's around you. And I thought that was a lot like the four reports that Russell was explaining. Knowing what's ahead is like the income and expense report. Knowing how fast you're going is like how fast you're spending money and that's reported in your balance sheet. Checking your dashboard is like your bank reconciliation, learning if everything is all right with your money, if it balances, make sure you're not leaking any. And finally, checking around and seeing what's going on is like knowing your delinquencies, who is, who is not paying, who's behind, those kinds of things. And those four reports all work together to help you know what's going on financially at your association. 
Well, it's one thing to have a grip or to know the pulse of the association, and those four reports do a great job, but it's also important to plan for the journey ahead. Planning ahead is an important part of running a fiscally responsible association. It means just that, thinking ahead, figuring out where the road you're on is going and what you need to bring along to arrive safely. Outside professionals are a great resource, so you as a board or manager can get the information or insights that you need. And that's part of the three-part business judgment rule that should guide all board decisions. If any of your decisions are ever challenged, you'll have a strong defense if your actions showed that you cared for the needs of the association, you were loyal to the needs of the association above your own personal interests or needs, and that you reached out for help making inquiries when you didn't know the right thing to do. So reaching out for help is not a sign of weakness, it's a good idea. It is part of your job as a board member to know your limitations because you're responsible for the association and to go for help when necessary. And that's your duty of inquiry. And that's the foundation for being, the able, being able to answer the question, how much should we be setting aside for our association to be preparing responsibly for the future? And you get that answer by inquiring, looking in your reserve study. Now, you may be doing a reserve study yourself, but most associations reach out for an independent professional to give assistance. You don't want to be making great budgeted contributions, but those contributions have no basis in the reality of the needs of the association. Optimistic reserve contributions or guesses based on what you heard another association doing or what you think you can afford doesn't prepare you for your own predictable expenses. Now, it's your association's journey, and you need to know your upcoming expenses, how much cash you have on hand now, and how fast you need to be setting funds aside to prepare for those upcoming predictable expenses. So look at your reserve study. Hopefully, that's a fresh document, and look for your recommended contribution amount. That's what's going to help you meet the needs of your association. For this association, it'll take $15,500 a month to offset ongoing deterioration, basically keep them balanced and prepare for upcoming expenses. And you wanna look at it in the big picture. Check your multi-year plan. It should be outlined in your reserve study. Being fiscally responsible means your reserve fund is projected to provide for all your expected upcoming reserve expenses without reliance on special assessments or loans for the next 20 years at least. So know your plan and make sure your association stays on that plan. If you do want to kick the tires and test some adjustments to that plan to perhaps suit the needs of your budget, all association reserve clients have access to an online reserve calculator that we call Uplanet. It's loaded with your data, and that's a tool that our clients use to test what happens with maybe some different expenses, some timing, um, different size expenses, maybe a different starting balance or different contribution rates. So you can take ownership of your plan and confirming what you need to do to prepare. And that brings us to the end of our prepared content. Money is the fuel that runs your association. You need to keep it safe. You need to have good systems in place to manage your finances. Use the four main reports that help you know what's going on with your money and have a plan to get your association successfully from here to the future. A fiscally responsible association is a peacefully is a is a peaceful and productive association with a bright future. It doesn't have financial surprises or special assessments. It maintains high property values and all it takes is applying the sound financial principles that we shared today. For more information on Russell and how his company, Community Financials, helps associations all across the country with their finances and reporting, and to see if his company can provide a cost-effective solution for you, please visit communityfinancials.com. And by going to the Association Reserves website at reservesay.com, you'll find access to articles and other webinar recordings that'll help your association make wise decisions about reserves. 
And there you'll also be able to request a proposal to update your reserve study and get association reserves on your team. And one more resource that you might want to consider to help your association make fiscally responsible reserve decisions is our new book, Understanding Reserves. You can order it straight from Amazon, or those of you interested in bulk orders can get a discount by ordering through our website. And that brings us to our Q&A time, which will be handled by Paige, our moderator today. <music>